My clock says 1.30, so let's get started. Can we start with a roll call, please? Roscoe? Morales? Here. Mayhem? Here. Esparza? Foley? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'm sure that the other two council members will be here as we move forward, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I want to bring your attention to the work plan. The work plan is new for this fiscal year, and Rosalind and I worked to make sure that there was a flow of our work items that made sense, both from our perspective, but also from staffs, so that we were getting the reports that we needed in a timely manner, but that we also weren't overburdening them by putting too many reports into one particular meeting. So we've spread things out over the year. You could take a look at that. And if you have any comments, I'm willing uh, to entertain a discussion on that right now or just, just move forward. I know the work plan was adopted at rules last week. So two of you or one of you, I know uh, Council Member Prowlis, you're on rules but uh, I don't think we had any major objections to the work plan. So without any uh, discussion, let's, let's move forward if that's, that's acceptable. Okay, great. We don't have any items on our consent calendar, so let's move uh, in, right into our reports of the committee. The first one is an economic update of, on our uh, activities. Uh, is Elizabeth here? Chair Foley, I don't see Elizabeth on the line. Oh, here she comes right now, just in time. Very good. She's probably listening for us. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Council Member Sparza is here as well. Thank you. So, Elizabeth, we're on your item. Would you like to give us your report? Yes, I'm happy to. I'll share my screen now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Are we live? Yes, we can, we can see your screen. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chair and uh, committee members. Um, Elizabeth Handler, Public Information Manager for the Office of Economic Development. Um, we're bringing you the September, I cannot believe it, uh, monthly uh, report and newsletter for the Office of Economic Development for the City of San Jose. And our first, our first item is the announcement of adding the cultural affairs to the name of OED, so we are now OEDCA, because there's never an, enough acronyms, right? We always love we always love having long strings of letters that we can just throw around. But it is a very um, a happy moment for us to be able to um, solidify the significance of cultural affairs and the arts as an extremely vital driver of economic and lifestyle well-being for the city. Um, one thing that we have found out during the uh, the pandemic and then the recovery period is the degree to which our artists are creative entrepreneurs. They are they are earning money, they are paying payroll, they are buying supplies, they're a vital part of our economy. So OEDCA is the new acronym of the day. Our major construction projects report for the second quarter of 2021 is out now. And it continues to be pretty rosy, uh, considering the, the lag in the construction process during the first parts of the of the pandemic when the, the total shutdowns were happening. Um, we're still doing. Uh, we're looking at some excellent openings that have happened. Both um, mural people are moving in. I don't know if anybody's been to City Hall recently, but the moving trucks are there. People are offloading and, and getting into their new apartments there. Um, the uh, uh, 188 West St. James, otherwise known as the former Silvery Towers, got its occupancy permit, so that they're also going to be able to start leasing actively now. Um, and then there are, as you know, many, many projects in, um, in the entitlement and, and, and approval stage, so it, it looks rosy. We have a nice little um, guest blog post from our downtown association giving us an update 
on what parking has been done doing since the pandemic and its recovery. And the good news is they steam cleaned all the garages. Everything is banking clean. There's no more bubble gum on the floors. Um, and the, there are, are new touchless uh, pay stations. And um, now the validation system has been changed, which was cumbersome for our merchants. Um, and it's now free 90 minutes of parking, which is much easier for everybody. So those are all good news. Uh, we still have news breaking on the economic front in terms of what, what kind of um, funding support is available for our small businesses. And uh, the good news is that more funds have been put into the California Small Business Relief Grant Program to the tune of another $1.5 million. Um, so they are going to be able to uh, fulfill the applications for some of those who were waitlisted. Um, and we're telling people if you did apply and you never heard anything, be sure to check your spam, clutter, and junk mail email folders because everybody who applies should have gotten an email back and you may, you may be waitlisted. So if you're waitlisted, you don't have to reapply. Um, and also there are gonna be some new openings for other kinds of grant applications. That's good news. And those are grants that don't have to be repaid. And then of course there are the loans that also don't have to be repaid. In this case, the Paycheck Protection Program loan which are forgivable to the tune of about 60% if you use the loan for the allowed uses, which include um, payroll related. So if, you're, if you used your PPP loan to pay your employees to keep your business open, and even if you couldn't open just to train them, then that loan is forgivable. And um, there's now an automated portal to sign up for the loan forgiveness, um, which are, the links are included in it. So that, that's good news too. Finally, we are including a little late, but the downtown report that you guys heard in June, um, we're now reporting on that to our folks and including a, um, a, a link to the, the presentation that Blagge did in June um, and the various statistics and background on the, uh, on the downtown report, which as, as you heard in June, had not been as badly impacted as we had feared, even though there are a lot of empty storefronts, but there are new businesses opening and we're gonna be including in next month's report the, um, the excitement and uh, ceremonies around the return of students and staff and professors to uh, San Jose State, which we celebrated last week and this morning too with the, the flag raising. Uh, which is awesome and good news. That's 36,000 more people eating lunch downtown every day. So that is really extremely good news. The other good news is that if you go to our partner, Visit San Jose's website, uh, which is sanjose.org, O-R-G, there's live events being listed again now. So that's exciting to see those coming back online and um, City Dance has come back, and we're going to be having another one the first Friday in September and the first Friday in October. So I hope to encourage everyone to come out for um, some exciting Latin live music and dance instruction at the dance. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, it, it's great to see so much activity. We had the jazz festival a couple of weeks ago and there were a lot of people there, a lot of vibrancy going along, uh, real positive conversations from people listening to music and to be able to be downtown. But uh, everyone should be concerned still about the pandemic and the Delta variant. And so be safe when you're out there and take whatever precaution you feel necessary, but hopefully you're going out and getting vaccinated. At least uh, at least I did, and I still wear a mask out in public. Uh, I kind of take my cue from whoever I'm around. If they're wearing masks, so am I. If they're not, then I'm probably not. So it really just kind of depends on the, the group I'm with. But, with. but it is good to be out with people again and uh, see their faces and make contact with them. 
So uh, before I go to the committee, I'm going to go to the members of the public, but I would remind the members of the public, you do have two minutes, but please stay focused on the topic at hand, which is the Economic Development Activities Report. We will have an opportunity for open forum that occurs at the end of the meeting, and you'll have two minutes to talk about whatever you want then, but please stay on topic with the Activities Report. With that, do we have any members of the public who'd wish to speak? Yes, Chair. Okay. Um, Michael, do you want me to call on him? I guess I will. Uh, Paul Soto. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, thank you for the report. Um, th this really is a tale of two cities. When I was listening to um, the the uh, the enthusiasm and the the uh, the levity with respect to uh, people moving into the building that is posted across the street from City Hall, it, you can tell there's a different of uh, perspectives and how we are viewing what is going on in the city. You see, uh, her enthusiasm and joy with respect to the moving trucks being there. For someone like me, that right there is a sign of just the, those people aren't even residents of San Jose. They're coming from all over the country, all over the country and the world. And so the, they are driving the economic uh, uh, lack of viability for large portions of this city. So while I can appreciate that the money Scott Neese, all of the downtown associations, they are the, they're the primary beneficiaries of COVID. The deaths that happened in this city, every single person that's sitting in front of those restaurants and that's sitting and just eating and just enjoying their time right there in the middle of a, what used to be a street, the only thing that put them there is the deaths of Latinos on the east side. There is no disconnect between those two. So I, like I said, the, the way that we're viewing what is going on in the city, what I'm experiencing is not opinion. These are facts. The, the, the connection between a person sitting and enjoying themselves and the uh, small businesses um, being glad that there's people eating there cannot be disconnected from what happened on the east side. They're connected. Thank you. Next caller is Blair Beekman. All right. Thank you. Happy Monday. Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the report. Uh, to speak on to the re uh, about the report and about the attachment, uh, just a few summaries and reminders of things uh, with the parking lot uh, issues, parking issues. A reminder of there will be some ALPR stuff with downtown parking issues. And um, a reminder of just the really good practices that we're developing pre-COVID around ALPR issues and data collection. Data collection, uh, they were holding the ALPR data info for about a year time, and they they brought it down to six months, 90 days. Um, you know, they were working in increments to like make it like they could get rid of the information sooner and they wouldn't have to store it and keep it which is really interesting work. It's simply based, guess what, on good democratic practices. Wow, <laughs> amazing thought, huh? I, it's, and you know, it just kind of helped uh, guide what, what made the process easier and more efficient for themselves to simply trust good open democratic practices and ideals and civil rights protections and civil, uh, civil liberty protections, I guess. Good stuff, you know, and uh, we've been talking about uh, data issues right now, it is uh, open democratic practices that are incredibly uh, meaningful and give ourselves love and joy and positiveness. It's all the good stuff of life. And uh, it was helping with better ALPR data collection practices. I hope we can continue those good efforts at this time. And uh, a reminder with 20 seconds that with the loan issues, um, you know, it, it's been specifically the purpose of these uh, grant and loan issues at this time that, um, it's not the fault of everyday people and community of, of these COVID issues. 
And it, we have to learn that kind of mind frame and, and how to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is Tessa Woodman C. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto, for really clarifying the uh, divide in our in our country in our in our city. And it is the rich. It is the politicians connected with the developers, and and then it's the slaves of capitalism that are the essential workers that have been destroyed because capitalism is about exploiting people and nature for profit. And that, that is what has happened. And, and that is the uh, transformational change we need is to change that. And then I see, I go to the rules committee and I hear that on the rules committee is money that is going to economic development from the Google, the Google, um, of the whatever, a hundred million dollars, whatever it is right now that we're dealing with. And that $3 million is going to economic development, the department, the city's department. And we have issues in our community, in my neighborhood. I need $3 million to buy that land at 615 Stockton Avenue so we do not get a hotel because that is not what we need. We need to be dealing with food security and, and that is what we're, we're talking about. We need nature heals, then nature heals. We have people in distress. We have the amount of, of, of climate refugees that are going to be pouring into our city is unbelievable what's happening right now. Those fires, the Dixie fire is not going out is what the science says because the rains aren't even coming to put it out. So these are the problems and it could be going to Tahoe. That's where it's going now, our richest place. And that, you know, like they say, it could have happened to a more deserving bunch because those are the people that are causing, it's all the driving to, to Tahoe and it's all the changes that we're made that you are not doing in our city. And you're giving yourself the economic development money from Google that was for mitigations in our community. That's criminal. And then it doesn't even get on the rules. They say, here, page one, page two. They don't even read what's going on in our meetings. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to move to council, but I just want to address a couple of things. First, uh, it's Elizabeth's job to be the cheerleader and the purpose of this report to report the positive outlook on the city. And I would challenge anyone to understand that the small businesses around San Jose State and around City Hall are happy to have us back because they employ local residents to work in their businesses at their restaurants. And when they were closed, they were not employing individuals and those individuals were not getting a paycheck. Now that the restaurants are open, then people are able to go back to work and that is a good thing. So I, I appreciate the comments, but I just wanted to make it really clear that the people who are moving in here could be San Jose State students who are going to, to school, who are living here, who are paying here to live here, and who are benefiting our community by being here in that they are supporting our local businesses, which in the end supports our employees and our workers and our residents. So with that, um, I, I also had a couple of comments regarding the grants. I, I uh, as a small business owner, I'm getting those notifications from the city and that's great. I think the city is doing a really good job at pushing out that message that grants are available. And as far as the PPP loans are concerned, those were a godsend to the small businesses to help them survive uh, through a really difficult time. So uh, the what has been difficult for the PPP loans was one, for small businesses to get them, but then now that they have them is how do they figure out whether their uh, PPP loan is forgivable or not. So they used to have to go directly through their bank and find out if it was forgivable that way. The fact that they can go now through the SBA makes it so much easier because that is a long and um, a long process with a little anxiety because businesses took the grant hoping that they would be forgiven, but then it actually has to be forgiven after you've spent the money. So I just wanted to um, thank you for reporting on those things, Elizabeth, and also regarding arts. Arts, uh, artists are very, uh, 
uh, they're entrepreneurs by nature and they have figured out a way to perhaps not thrive, but survive and also uh, deliver an artist, artistic message about the world we're living under with COVID and with the protests and with all the wildfires and everything that's happened. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that some of our artists are doing well. And next month at our CED committee meeting, we will have, I believe, two reports on various uh, facets, facets of art, artists and the artist community. So I look forward to hearing those as well. With that, I'll turn it over to the committee. Is there anyone from the committee who has a question? Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Chair. I'll be really quick. One, one question, one comment. I'll just do the comment first, which is that I have been unable to click the links in the attachment. I'm just wondering if there's a workaround. I don't know if this is posted publicly somewhere else, but I, I was unable to access any of the links, unfortunately. Is that something we can address? Can anyone help? Yes, council member. I'll, I'll work on it. Oh, okay. Thanks, Great. Mike. Thank you. Um, awesome. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we would love to actually share this with constituents. It's a great update. And then um, great to hear all the positive news. One question I had under the second update on construction is the line that says under review are also 7,555 housing units, as we know. I was just curious if we have an assessment of average days in the queue, how, how long they've been in that pipeline, what stage uh, those projects are in and what might accelerate them. Do we, do we have a perspective on that? It seems like there are a lot in the pipeline versus shovels in the ground. I'm just trying to better understand what the barriers are. And council member, um, Rosalind may well have additional information. I, I just wanted to let you know that at this moment we can follow up we don't have the specifics but one of the issues council member has been financing there have been a, a number of issues uh, for a variety of reasons costs that are making the projects not pencil at the moment so they're not getting their financing but um, we can follow up Rosalind um, sorry if I jumped the gun on you you might have other no, that's fine, Nancy. I, I would just add, uh, Councilmember Mahan, uh, regarding if, if a project is currently going through the planning permit stage, uh, we can certainly provide information. Um, Emily Lapoma, our development facilitator, works with the planning team in terms of tracking major development projects. So, um, and actually, we have reported in terms of our residential production numbers we uh, we have reported that information under our housing crisis work plan as well just a few weeks ago at council but we can certainly follow up with you on information on that yeah thank you so much and i i yes i remember seeing the same number a similar number a couple of weeks ago i i did find it interesting that and you can tell me if this is an uptick or not but over 1100 units submitted for review in the last quarter is that um is that an increase? And do we have any idea what we would attribute that to? Emily, do you have more of a, a recent update? You know, the numbers really well. Uh, sure, thank you. Emily LaPoma, OED. Um, so yeah, um, it is certainly a large number. Um, it could be attributed to a number of different things. We've seen many affordable housing projects um, begin to get proposed through planning. Um, this also might be a little bit of a uh, delayed response from 2020. Um, people who may have been proposing housing developments um, and planning on submitting them in 2020 may have held off a little bit and we might be seeing um, a bit of a um, uh, that coming in now. Right. Yeah. Well, that's exciting and, and makes sense. Okay. Thanks. I, I appreciate it and look forward to chatting more offline. Thank you. Great. If there's no further comments from council, is there a motion to accept the report? Yes. Move to accept the report. I'll second. second. Any further discussion? If not, then would you please take the roll? Is it Tony? Is that yeah. here? Yeah, I just, I have two mute buttons to unmute. I'm Sorry, Carrasco. Tony. Okay. Carrasco? Aye. Prowlis? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
Next, we have a presentation regarding the city road roadmap, the community and economic recovery task force status. Rosalind, are you making that presentation? I, yes, I am. Thank you so okay. much, Chair Foley, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager, and I'm glad to be with you this afternoon to provide um, a high level um, update on where we are with the community and economic recovery task force. So next slide. So as part of the city council's priority session and roadmap process earlier this year, council member Perales proposed the creation of a citywide COVID-19 recovery task force that would look at the models of the greater downtown San Jose economic recovery task force and that of the health and racial equity task force. So the idea was to establish a cross sector community based group. Um, that would lead the city in terms of recovery. Next slide. Um, so just as a reminder, the principles of the city roadmap process include helping the city clarify its priorities, designing a transparent arena for input and deliberation, aligning with our budget process as a strategic planning mechanism, and integrating an equity-based approach to the city's decision-making. And on this slide, uh, you'll see the city's approved roadmap. It includes 41 initiatives, 18 of which are COVID-related. Um, and then the first row you'll, of the roadmap, you'll see the community and economic recovery enterprise priority items. Also, um, at the May 4th Council Study Session, uh, staff shared its initial principles for recovery and how our work is going to be grounded. And we acknowledge that uh, the journey to healing and recovery and resilience will require really unprecedented effort and resources and creativity across our community and our organization and city government. We know that this recovery work is not for us to do alone, but rather we are working with our community for the benefit of those who are most burdened by the crisis. We are guided by their wisdom, we're tapping into their potential, and we're building on their deep enduring strength. Next slide. Um, before, I also want to add that um, the staff did establish some initial guiding principles to help us along with this work. Um, and of course, we are leading with people. Um, we are definitely leading with equity. Uh, and we are choosing um, that we're going to acknowledge the value of everyone in our process, particularly our neighbors in our community, and that we're choosing to be empathetic, which means that we are taking the time to see an issue or an experience through someone else's eyes versus through our own. And obviously through all of this work, it has to lead to meaningful action and to change outcomes for our residents. Um, so in terms of roles and responsibilities for the task force, um, we really see this group um, as advising and monitoring the progress of the roadmap recovery initiative. So those items in the pink boxes that you saw on the city roadmap. Um, obviously, the group will be deep in engagement with our community and will be developing a, a community engagement and communication strategy. And a big part of this group's work is really going to be sharing information. So taking information back to their community groups, um, asking questions about what's working, what's not, what's needed, where are the gaps, and then bringing that information back to the group. Um, and then ultimately developing new uh, recommendations for our city council to consider. Next slide. So um, staff has actually looked at a couple of different models in terms of a proposed composition for the recovery task force. Um, we have many groups that have been established that staff has worked with um, in the past. And we think that the station area advisory group or the SAG is a good model to use. Um, we just completed that process um, with the Downtown West uh, development project uh, a few months ago. And so we're suggesting to use that as a model for the recovery task force. 
So at this point, we are suggesting that the, the task force be uh, made up of no more than 35 member organizations. And then realizing this is a citywide uh, task force and that um, we have many items to discuss. You'll see this list here of, of items that staff has initially come up with, including health and housing and digital equity, childcare, arts and culture, of course, reemployment and workforce development and small business recovery. And obviously, as we work with the task force, there may be other items uh, and other topics they, they may want to tackle as well. Next slide. So again, engagement is going to be core to the work of the task force and, and with staff. Uh, in terms of the process for the task force, we're looking at monthly meetings. Of course, these would be open to the public. There will be Brown active meetings. So anyone would be um, able to participate. Um, and really it's a re an opportunity for city staff to provide report outs on the roadmap initiatives. Again, a lot of information sharing on what's working and what's not. Um, at this point, we are thinking that um, we may invite guest speakers to come in uh, and to present. Um, obviously, there is a lot of recovery work um, ongoing, not just in the city, but in our region that we think that we can learn from. So hearing from some of those groups and individuals we think uh, will be very helpful for the task force. Uh, we definitely envision uh, an early um, item for the task force is what we're calling uh, an ARP 101. So learning all about um, the ARP funds, their el eligibility. And so uh, we are looking to inform the group of all of that as well. And then we're looking at uh, or suggesting that the group may want to establish solution groups. So there may be some topics um, child care, uh, for example, that um, uh, a certain members of the group really wanna dig in uh, and work with the community in coming up with, with those recommendations for now, next, and later. And again, as I mentioned, leveraging other efforts that are, are already underway. Um, and you see here in, in this graphic, right, um, of course, the work of the task force will be based, grounded in data and, and analysis. Um, and also equally important, it's going to be based on um, our the experiences of the members of our communities. Um, we know that uh, many people have been burdened, have been greatly impacted. Um, families have lost loved ones. People have loved, lost jobs. And we are looking to see, I think there's two major focus um, areas of focus, and it's really how we stabilize our families, how we strengthen our family unit, how do we make sure our children are healthy, are fed, are able to go to school and learn, um, to make sure that, that the family unit is whole and healthy, and also making sure that there is um, a reliable income, right, coming into those households so that those households can, can begin to sustain themselves. So obviously a lot of work around workforce development and small business uh, recovery. And then in terms of the community participation spectrum, um, you know, there are many different levels of how you engage the community, um, all the way from informing um, to um, involving, to consulting, to collaborating and to empowering. So we are gonna be looking at all of those different levels in terms of engagement. Next slide. So in terms of our next steps, we are looking uh, to provide the city council with a staff recommendation on the task force membership next month. Uh, after which we would go through the nomination process. Um, we are suggesting that each member organization would decide amongst themselves who would actually serve on the task force. So we would go through that process and get those actual names. And then when we are anticipating the first task force meeting to take place probably in late October. And then we would be back to the CED committee with uh, our next status uh, report in April of next year. And I believe that is the last slide. Yes, and with that, I am happy to take any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Thank you for your report. First, I'll go to members of the public. 
Tessa, you're first. Tessa Woodmansey, you're first oh, on, no. the, on the you. task force, the roadmap right. task force. All right, the roadmap, I guess ARP, I'm not really clear exactly what ARP stands for. I think we have to be careful using acronyms and really describe things more clearly to everybody. I think that the the um, public outreach is is very insufficient about how you do things. I mean, even if I go to the rules committee, how many people go to your rules committee and I don't get any data about what's on the agenda? I mean, that's an example, you know, uh, of how poorly our city is is run, and and that there isn't, you know, it's supposed to be even for the whole. So getting back to this whole issue of um, uh, you know, rebuilding back and is a very critical issue. And there's um, a lot of BS about even that there's a housing crisis because you guys just passed in my neighborhood wouldn't even allow affordable housing based on Deb Davis. Yeah, so we're talking about the task force okay. status report here. I know. Could you I know. On the yes. task force? Yeah. Okay. Now you're going to interrupt me. Yeah. I was talking about the task force that we lost housing in my neighborhood. Okay. So now. I am fighting for clean air. I've been fighting for clean air in my neighborhood since I've been here because I live across from a diesel bus depot, okay, that harassed us with noise. Okay, so I'm talking about equity in terms of pollution and in terms of the impacts on my neighborhood, the death and disability that has come to my neighborhood, okay, the Garden Alameda, because we are near the tracks. We are on the tracks. We are on the Caltrain diesel dealing with the Caltrain, with the CMOF in our community. With We are in a care community and nothing has been done to, to my neighborhood. And then, oh, don't forget about the airport. You know, when they're talking about Hill, Hillview. Well, yeah, and the pollution and the lead. We've been fighting it. Citizens Against Airport Pollution with our mayor. We, we've been fighting it with our airport and the diesel. and the, the So that's why I'm saying we need to grow food. We need a fossil fuel free event, um, um, installation in my neighborhood because of the, the impacts of all the climate crisis that is based on the pollution and, and burning of fossil fuels. And that's why I say we need a fossil fuel free built uh, garden. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. I'm asking if you can please not put that bell at the, at the end. Just once our public comments are done, that's, that's just it. That's, that's like a dismissal. And so I would ask, please, if you can cancel the bell. Thank you. Um, Rosalind, my comments are not directed at you, but they're directed at the fact that at the uh, meeting last week, I asked the city auditor, which goes through every single department. He had the word equity and the equity word was lowercase. It was not capitalized. And I had an issue with that. Okay, because you have to, it, it, that is a noun that needs to be capitalized. Okay, and so the, when I asked him, what lens, how did you apply this word that you used three times and on a city document? Say, how, what did you apply? What principles did you use? And what deficiencies did you find in all of these departments with respect to centering equity within the context of city government? And what issues do you feel need to be addressed because obviously, if you use this equity lens, you would have extracted the disparities and would be able to articulate them. Why? Because you use the equity lens with respect to the department. Because we're dealing with institutionalized racism here that still has not been dealt with. So you want to create all this system to, 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 uh, to develop our economic uh, viability for the future. I'm sorry, Senora, but we haven't even dealt with the past. We're st we are still dealing with the, I am still dealing, literally hundreds of thousands of people in the city are still dealing with the after effects of two things, manifest destiny in 1846 and the redlining policies that were created in uh, 1938. Until we start dealing with that first, primarily, then move from there, we ain't going to get nowhere. Thank you. Blair Beekman. All right, thank you. Thank you for this item. Thank you for Paul's words. Uh, thank you for the task force. Uh, I'm hopeful what it can accomplish. Uh, to begin with, you know, we've been wanting to practice ideas of a uh, digital equity that's a part of this memo and, and ideas of bridging a digital divide. 
incredibly, incredibly important, but what about the open public policy ideas that can go with helping to bridge the digital divide? These were difficult subjects for all of us to talk about a few years ago. I think it's more easier, uh, easier to comprehend and understand what its good role and purpose for, you know, this concept of working arm in arm and hand in hand towards with these with this subject matter. It's just it, it just speaks volumes to the ideas of equity, of community morale, of good democratic practices. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish with this work. So really look into it. Um, I thank you. This item is like a compliment to your work on, uh, you had a, a huge hour and a half long session at City Council on the future of uh, digital uh, issues for the city, smart, smart issues last week. This really complements that work. And I spoke earlier the importance of the democratic process, um, you know, in, in data collection work and what it can really work towards. And so you're, you're, you're doing that now. You're getting awesome advice from Paul we really have to look at our uh, background and, and what practices are we doing as government that you want to continue doing because you like it so much, but it actually is a hindrance and it is a problem and it is an issue. When are you going to learn to take that up more with, with community? Uh, that's important. And I have more to speak about this item, I think, at open forum time, but you're on to a good start. And it's important that this fall, we really consider open democratic practices considering we've had a tough month of May with BTA stuff and with COVID issues, uh, open democratic practices are incredibly positive. Let's all be working towards it. You guys are, thank you. Thank you. Phone number 5140, Michael Sonsini. Hey, hey Pam, this uh, economic recovery task force, really, you, you can't polish a turd. OK, you should have an economic recovery task force 10 years ago. You ever see that downtown? It's disgusting. And the bell at the end, I, I'm with Paul. It's stupid and weird. I mean, definitely someone from the school board probably gave you the idea. But uh, yeah, no, this it's not going to happen. This, there's not going to be an economic recovery uh, if you're going to keep with uh, these policies, like wanting to have COVID papers when you go to a restaurant or an indoor concert. I mean, that's going to be on the agenda tomorrow with uh, with Sam o, uh, Obama's supporter Licardo. He, you know, he's gonna he's gonna go just by the way of uh, copying New York and San Francisco, and it's not gonna work. I mean, I don't want to go places having to wear a mask anymore, and I don't. And you're not gonna have any economic recovery. If you're going to keep repressing people, I'm looking forward to the lockdowns that you guys are going to probably impose in the next couple of months. We're on the campfire said this on the table, but uh, yeah, no, and you know that in your whole town hall, not letting me on. That's great. Cause I'm going to have my own town hall at your uh, little uh, Viva park thing on the 26th. I'll be there. And then we can discuss some issues because you refused to discuss them the other day. You kept me out of that, which is illegal, by the way. Uh, I was one of the first people to sign in, and for a whole hour, you never called on me. I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. And you should be ashamed of yourself looking at this district with the burned out building on Hillsdale that, that one of your staff members knew nothing about. You put a guy in a meeting who knows nothing about the district on his first day of the job, and he promised to get back to me, and he didn't. I had to call your office. Jeffrey Buchanan. Uh, Chair Foley, uh, members of the commission, uh, committee, I should say. Um, good afternoon, uh, Jeff Buchanan, I'm here for Working Partnerships. Um, yeah, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, Rosalind and, and staff for their work uh, preparing this outline around the Economic Recovery Task Force. and. You know, uh, thank uh, Councilmember Perales for first putting the idea forward during priority setting. Um, just a couple of uh, quick thoughts. Um, certainly, there, there's a tremendous amount of work ahead in defining uh, the city's economic recovery. Um, I think it's important as we create this process that we ensure that it's uh, we we have a, a meaningful schedule that it will allow for this body to really be able to uh, provide input. Uh, around the American Recovery uh, uh, Plan dollars. Uh, certainly, Council will begin its exploration of some of those issues 
uh, perhaps a little bit before this uh, this body really gets up and, and fully running. So trying to make sure that uh, we're lining up the timing of those two processes is, is going to be really important. Um, secondly, you know, beyond the American recovery plan dollars, uh, there's the potential for another uh, couple of large sets of appropriations coming out of Congress with, with these infrastructure bills. Uh, trying to think about how this particular body uh, may be able to help uh, the city think about how it positions and plans around leveraging uh, some of those large financial flows that, that could really help to accelerate our recovery uh, as well. Uh, lastly, um, it's really important uh, as we think about this recovery that we make sure we're centering workers. You know, we talked a lot about essential workers uh, in, in regards to uh, uh, the COVID emergency. You know, we have, we as a city, we, we passed some very important policies. We need to make sure that we have worker voices, uh, labor unions, worker centers, other worker voices uh, from those industries that have been hit the hardest uh, at the table. We've been good about having nonprofits, about having small businesses involved in these kinds of conversations. We need to make sure we're not forgetting workers. Thank you, Jeffrey. And and that's a, a good point as to the makeup of the committee or the task force. There's a, there's a huge space called others, and I'm hoping that labor and other uh, working partnerships will be involved in that others, but I, there's a lot of room with a 35 member organization to make sure that we reach out to all representatives and we have a, a cross uh, representation of uh, participants on the task force. So thank you for uh, your suggestions on that. Uh, turning back to council, council member Esparza. Thanks, um, I had uh, some questions um, and actually really, I'll just go straight to comments in terms of suggestions on the makeup of the task force. How, how, I'll start with the question and then go into the comments. How far have we gone in terms of um, maybe not identifying a name, but identifying key partners and organizations or buckets, right? Um, the previous caller mentioned nonprofits and workers. Have, have, how far have you gone in sort of identifying those buckets? Yeah, thank you so much, Councilmember Esparza. So right now we are meeting with a host of folks. I've, I've had several calls with individuals um, asking for suggestions. Um, obviously, one of the first places is the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Um, their organization actually have many, many members who we know uh, would probably be a great idea to have them participate um, on the task force, including the Race um, Equity Action Leadership Coalition. Uh, we have been introduced to them and their members. Um, obviously workers, we know it's important to, to have them represented um, on the task force as well. You know, those from the, the business sector, um, we really are looking for a really good cross section of, of individuals. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and on the business sector, um, you know, we really need to focus on small businesses. It's the, some of the large corporations have had the best uh, quarters they've ever had in the past year, uh, but our small businesses have had, as, as you well know, uh, a much different experience. Um, so I, uh, so I um, wanted to ask another question, actually, before I kind of get into my comments, which is, um, so the purpose of the task force, and I'd also like to thank um, Council Member Frales for um, suggesting this um, during COVID, but it's utilizing these models, creating cross-sector recommendations to the city council in terms of COVID economic and social recovery. Um, you know, I think even just as recently as a few months ago, I think we, we had hoped to be in a different place than we are now. Um, we had hoped to really be in recovery instead of really looking at another wave with Delta and we might have, um, you know, a, a few more variants come in. And, and so this is um, the response while simultaneously doing response and recovery, I think is gonna go on a lot longer than we had initially hoped. How are, um, how are you seeing the work of this task force incorporate 
that response portion as we don't just go into recovery, right? We need to do recovery, but we're also a little bit in response mode as things change around us very rapidly. How do you see that moving forward? Thank you, council member. That is a really great question. And, and honestly, I will say that we are still thinking about how that's going to work. Obviously, when we were at city council, you know, back in May, we thought this recovery would be mm -hmm. kicking off at a much yeah. different rate and speed and focus. And to your point, now we find ourselves doing both responding and recovery at the same time. So, so honestly, I think that we're going to be figuring this out as we go along. And I, I'm hopeful that all of the task force members will be flexible with us. Um, we've already begun to have discussions about perhaps there may be a need to shift some of the funding where we thought it would be more on the recovery side of the house. Actually, there could be a need to bring it back more to response where we're looking more at, at basics, food and necessity, things like that. Um, so, so honestly, I, I think that, you know, we're going to be monitoring it very closely and making those decisions and, and making pivoting um, as necessary through both response and recovery. Thank you. Yeah. And that was sort of one of the, well, that was really the question I was asking myself as I read the memo and looked at the presentation. And in addition to sort of the timing, connecting the timing with the money, because uh, next month we're going to get more information as we go back to take the second bite of the budget um, in October, which you know, the reality is that we might have to put, have a, a, another bite at the apple and really save some money, um, you know, later than we thought to try and apportion some of that because we may still be in response uh, for longer. But I, as I was reading the memo and looking at the presentation, I was looking at two things. I was um, looking at um, connecting, uh, the listening part of it, um, but also the operational part of it. And so I had some requests in terms of the operational part of it based on the experiences of the last 18 months. I thought of the different initiatives that we have undertaken as a city, whether it's digital equity, whether it's food, whether it's isolation and support um, in, the, in the response phase. Um, not to mention trying to get people vaccinated in, in a short while, we're going to be pushing again to get people to get their booster, so booster shots. And so one of the strongest partners across each of these different buckets that we have had during the entire COVID response has been our school districts. We have leaned on them for everything. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that we have school districts be a part of this task force. And I know folks might say, oh, we'll have the county you know, office of ed. I'm actually gonna push a little bit harder and say, we should do some outreach to the East Side Union High School District, San Jose Unified School District, um, Franklin McKinley and Allen Rock and uh, probably Oak Grove and Mount Pleasant and Evergreen has um, not only West Evergreen, they have Welch Park, they have some very hard hit areas. Um, and, and ask them, like, how do you want to interface with us moving forward? Because they're hammered right now trying to start um, back to school. Um, and, you know, we've all read the newspapers, we all read what's happening in LA and San Francisco and Oakland, like schools are looking at, uh, some of them have already had to like, isolate and quarantine and it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride I think and so we need to ask them how they want to interface with us if it is through the county office of ed great but I think we need to ask them how do you want to interface with us on these different buckets we might get some responses saying well when it comes to these bu buckets this might be the best approach when it comes to these other buckets, sometimes, you know, they're going to be going 100 miles an hour. Maybe they just need us to do that extra outreach and make sure that we get their input um, and, and as well as their, frankly, operational partnership. We couldn't have done a single thing that we've done during COVID without the school districts. Um, the other thing, you know, you said something really important in your presentation, which is stabilizing families. Um, and uh, that's a really powerful statement. And again, I, as I thought of, I know we have SVCN, but as I thought of partners 
um, again, that we've worked with across multiple buckets. I would look at first five being another one um, because they've helped us with food, with um, diapers, but uh, you know, all of those things, but more importantly, they've been a link in these hard hit neighborhoods. They are on the ground in these hard hit neighborhoods across our city. Um, and again, it's, uh, I think, a critical partner to hear what's happening on the ground. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that we have a huge question mark. I mean, we have just this sort of Damocles hanging over our heads in terms of housing instability with the moratorium due to expire in September. And we're not allowed to kind of step in. Um, we still have millions of dollars in rental assistance that needs to get out the door. Um, that needs to be, and I, and I understand there are lots of different partners, even if it's just um, our own housing department, making sure that they are able to make presentations to give accurate, up-to-date data, um, but that we address housing instability in this task force, because if our families aren't stable, if our workers aren't stable, then our businesses aren't stable, our neighborhoods and city isn't stable. Um, and I uh, realize that's a little uncertain. Um, and I think somebody already mentioned workers, which I do think it's, it's important. Um, and I'd really like, just on the business end, I'd really like to focus on small businesses because we need to hear more from them. Um, and, uh, but on the worker side, we're really sort of missing uh, that voice in terms of what their needs are. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted to mention Councilmember Carrasco, I know she's here, but she leads a health equity task force. And I, I am sure you've already included it in the work plan, but to have that task force present to, um, to the community, to our own uh, recovery task force to create a linkage between them, I think is important um, because we are going to need that health equity. We're going to need vaccinations and testing going on a lot longer than we um, seen, particularly as we continue to see employer mandates grow, we might want to partner more with employers to do pop-up vaccinations, pop-up uh, testing as these mandates roll out um, so that we can really help the families um, as well as our economy. So um, that's, that's it for me. I just wanted to give that input. I know we'll be able to see what that plan looks like in September. Um, but there's uh, a lot a lot happening right now in regards to COVID. It's changing daily. Thank you. Whoops, on mute. Thank you, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair um, and staff for the, the presentation, Council Member Esparza, uh, for your, your comments. Um, I, I agree. Uh, you know, we didn't necessarily expect to be in this situation, uh, but quite frankly, we I think we always knew that the the pandemic was dynamic, and and we weren't uh, fully out. And uh, we know that we're not out today. And I think that the task force, uh, you know, its purpose still can be uh, fulfilled. Uh, that's exactly what I heard from community members last year was was simply just wanting to have a forum, a space for communication, uh, dialogue, exchange of, of ideas, concerns. Uh, there's so much going on, as we do know, orders from the federal government, the state, our county, uh, local here within the city, opportunities for support, um, you name it, right? And it's really, really difficult when you're just catching uh, news flashes of, of what's, you know, what's changed or what's new, what opportunities are there. And the, the best thing that uh, the, the two task forces, I, I had a, a privilege of also being invited by Councilmember Carrasco to the Health and Racial Equity Task Force. Um, the best thing was really this opportunity for uh, dialogue, uh, again, and, and, and having that on a regular basis, especially with as rapidly as things were changing. And, and here we are again, uh, that's exactly uh, where we remain. And we may not be fully in recovery, we may be still within response uh, but I think that the task force can discuss really all three, and especially if the right our goal, my goal was that um, it be a year long. And uh, I think that the the conversation around response, recovery, and resiliency, all three of them are going to be actually you know one and the same as we're talking about it. And that's what our community has been doing 
uh, right, for the last year and a half, whether you're small businesses, um, you know, nonprofit organizations, health organizations that have been out there serving the community, um, we're, we're responding while we're also trying to remain resilient um, and, you know, recover or, or in essence, survive, whether it's, uh, you know, physically as individuals or uh, as small businesses. And so they're all happening uh, at once, unfortunately. So it is a lot to manage. And I think just having the, the forum, the, the space for this participation from our community is really important. That was the feedback that we heard from the, the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force that, uh, that I helped form last year. And, and, and really, um, that's where the, the idea came from, was seeing the successes there, seeing the success with the Health, Health and Racial Equity Task Force led by Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, and that's why I also wanted to include both of those into that uh, direction so that that way we're not simply just focused on the, the business aspect, uh, but we're really encompassing all of it. Um, the, the health aspects, but clearly, again, we're, you know, we're still knee deep. Um, and also the, the equity, both of the response within health, but also the, the equity within the recovery and, and how we're looking at um, who, is, who is in those conversations uh, and where we're really providing opportunities as recovery is here. And, and the biggest one, as we know, is, is the American Recovery uh, Funds. And I wonder, because it wasn't spelled out, I know we've talked about this, that we did want this task force to be able to have a say on those dollars that's been discussed. It didn't make it actually into writing, or at least I didn't see it in the memo. Is that still the direction, Rosalind? Thank you, Council Member. Well, certainly the, the task force in their advisory role um, on the roadmap initiatives, obviously we have the opportunity to advise and question and guide um, the city departments who are currently working on the initiatives. Um, and we are also exploring, and I'm, I'm talking with Jim Shannon about this, and he's gonna be coming out with an info memo uh, around the Amer American Recovery Plan. Um, dollars as well, I think later this month, um, if um, there would be an opportunity to actually allocate um, some of that funding to the task force um, by which they could come up um, with some level of, of actions or recommended actions to the city council as well. So we're also exploring that. Okay. And I think, you know, initially that's what I was thinking was, you know, do we set aside some funds, but I actually uh, I, I supported the direction that we discussed back in May when we accepted our budget, which was that uh, we could just leave open, just that it's more of an open-ended where this task force, we're taking feedback and advice because we're, we're not going to allocate all of the ARF dollars um, next month, right? As, as a council, we've already discussed that, the, the fact that this and these dollars were intended to be over the next couple of years where we could spread that out. So we could take this feedback in our allocation of it now, which again, this task force is just forming. So maybe it's not gonna be able to, to help educate our discussion on the council, uh, the, the, the first one coming up, um, but that's not gonna be a, a complete allocation of all the, the funds. And so uh, I think uh, what I'd like to do is ensure that, the, that we are giving this task force some um, authority in giving us direction on, hey, here's where we think you should be allocating some of these future dollars. Um, and one of the recommendations I'll, I'll ask uh, as I make a motion uh, momentarily would be that we actually come back a little sooner than April. Uh, I'd like to come back within three months at first and, and see if we could, um, even if it's just get initial thoughts, I, I believe that the task force is likely going to you know, dive in and, and already have um, some advice to share. And if, if that gives us an opportunity uh, to be thinking ahead of time of, of, again, it could be preliminary, but what their thoughts are. I'd like to hear back before April, um, so maybe in, in January, um, beginning of the year or February, if we're not meeting in January. So I would like to, to, to hear back a little sooner for, on a report back to this committee. And then, um, and then additionally, as was described in April, which can help uh, us inform if we do have any major budget discussions uh, based on what this task force is providing. But I'd like to, to include that. I'll include that within my, my motion. Um, and then uh, I, I would like to see some language again that sort of makes it specific on how this task force will have an authority. I, I want them to know that they'll have some authority to give some direction on whether it's American Rescue Fund dollars or really just quite frankly on, on knowing that they can provide uh, recommendation directions to the council on, on how we might allocate um, support and, and resources 
Um, I think that's that's there again. It just wasn't explicit within um, within the memo, and uh, and and I want to be flexible as well. I know we we mentioned thirty five. Uh, I I uh, remember how the formation of the stationary advisory group, uh, you know, came about, and uh, and I I want to ensure that at least we're putting the message out there that we're not it's not set in stone that 35 and I'm sorry, that's it, right? If, if there's a 36 that the council is debating on or something, right, that we're going to say, um, sorry, we're at our limit. I think we should be flexible and, I, and we can have that discussion at the council when this conversation comes back, but I wanted to be able to put that out there now. And the last thing, this is based on Councilmember Esparza's comments, um, just to give an example of how we had it work on the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force, we had different committees uh, based on, you know, if, for us, it was different areas of, of uh, business segments of business, but in this case, it could be different areas of expertise and, and focus. Um, and in those committees were a lot more participation from you know other organizations. And we actually allowed each of those committees, much like we're talking about here, uh, we would allow them to choose who actually sat on the task force as a representative for those committees or those areas. Um, but for instance, if I, I agree with Councilor Sparza, we we need to have our education leaders at the table. We can have a committee that invites in each of the different school districts uh, or even schools if they want to, you know, individually have a participation in these committees that will meet uh, separately throughout the month. But then there will be a position or two as well in the task force out of the 35 or so members, right, that is able to to be that liaison between that that, that committee. But then that way it's not um, it's not something where, as Councilman Sparza described, it's not just one representative from Santa Clara County Office of Education, and then we're not getting any communication between the schools themselves or the school districts themselves. The committee function was a great function with our, uh, uh, again, Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force, where that committee function allowed more voices to be at the table, um, and, uh, and, and it, it worked well. So uh, that's just another area of feedback. So I'll, I'll make a motion that we accept the, the report here and, and just with that one change that we do come back um, initially with, within uh, three months or, or January, February timeframe when, when that works out for this committee. Second. Second. Thank you, that's it, Chair. Thank you, keep taking myself off mute. Um, I just had a question about, thank you, Council Member Prowlis, for bringing forward the idea of a task force. The And, and you're right, uh, it is more than just a recovery at this point. It's response, recovery, and resiliency. Those are really important that we take into consideration all the aspects of, of uh, life as we know it right now, including the health of our residents and our schools and digital inclusion, et cetera. There's a lot of uh, three buckets as council member Esparza referred to. Um, I'm a little concerned about the time frame, though. If, if the task force first meets in, is called together in October, it's not likely that we'll have anything for us in January. We don't have a meeting in December, so our next meeting would be in January. So I'm a little concerned about pushing them to get a report to us by January or February, but you're not comfortable with April. You're feeling that's too late to get the first report. So what is it, can you narrow the focus then on what you'd like that first report to be so that we can set their expectations of the task force of what we want to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll state the reason and, and give my uh, an example as well. So I think that number one, time is of the essence, right? And if we're really going to ask this task force to, and, and if they're going to feel as though they're valuable to us, uh, I think they're going to want to know that they can bring some recommendations to us sooner than next April um, with how much is changing. And then the example, and I, I'm willing to set a, a low bar as well. For instance, uh, it doesn't have to be a written report. It could be a verbal right, report that says, here's how the task force is going. Here's what we're hearing. Uh, but I think that would be the low bar. And then here's why, the example I'll give as to why I think it could even be a lot more than that. Uh, we were also maybe expecting a little slower process with the Greater uh, Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force. We thought we'd meet for six months or so, and then we'd put together a set of recommendations. After the second meeting, what we heard from the, the members was they were very eager to provide immediate sets of recommendations to the county, the city, and the state, to all, all three entities, right? They wanted to put together a set of recommendations. So what we ultimately did 
was within three months, we put together an, an, an initial set of recommendations, knowing that it wasn't, that wasn't the end all be all. It was sort of just, here's the, the first things that are high priority to us, but that we've already, you know, we already want to send recommendations forward. And it did actually come forward in a, you know, in a, in a package, a, a formal written, you know, letter to each of the three agencies, you all might remember uh, that came last year. Um, and then we did it again at the end of the year in December, and then we did it again six months later. So, so it, it, essentially there was a series of recommendations and, um, and they, the, the task force was very ambitious. I don't know if that'll be, you know, the, the same uh, that happens with this task force. And we, I think we could set the low bar that says, hey, let's at least get a verbal update in January when, when this committee meets to see how things are going. Maybe they're ready to set some early recommendations to us. Uh, maybe not, but I think we should, we should, for us, we should plug that, that place in January on our, on our agenda. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. That really helps clarify it for me. I'm happy to support that. There is some urgency to this where the, the recovery, we can't wait a year to talk about the recovery and you're with based on your experience in in your first task force dealing with the economic recovery you saw a lot of a uh, of urgency in those the participants so uh that i i appreciate that thank you for that clarification okay council member mahan thanks chair and uh Appreciate staff's work on this and Councilmember Perales is uh, bringing forward this idea. It makes makes sense to me. I just had a couple of quick questions. So one is, you know, as Councilmember Perales was describing the value and, and one of the primary values being that sort of communication, exchange of ideas, keeping people in the loop on what's going on, that conflicts a little bit with that cap at 35. And even if, even if the cap was 50, you still would be really limited and, and how much outbound communication is happening. So I guess I'm just curious if there's, if the prior, if one of the primary values really is that communication and coordination piece, what, what mechanism this task force would have to do that? Is that part of the game plan or is it primarily about generating cross-functional ideas from within the 35? So I just wanted to better understand the relative priority. And again, the, the mechanism for doing I guess, outbound communication and coordination if that is a primary value. Thank you so much, Councilmember Mayhan. So yes, I mean, the, the, the thinking is that we want to um, cultivate, right, uh, this forum for the task force members to exchange ideas. Um, and I would say probably more importantly, or just as importantly, um, you know, the, the task force members are going to be part of organizations that are already working in our neighborhoods and our communities. So, um, you know, they're going, they're the ones who already have their ear to the ground and can bring that information back from those neighborhoods, from the folks who have been hit the hardest, bring it back to the larger task force group. Um, so I see it working both ways. It's both a forum for the task force members to share information, to get presentations, to work together, right, for staff to share information. But just as importantly, we need those task force members to bring information back to the group and to staff in terms of what they're hearing in the neighborhoods. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's that that makes it that's right on, though I would say 35 is pretty limited. So I just want to understand how we ensure that the word gets out to the small business owner in district 10, for example, or the whatever, you know, how do we ensure that it, it, with a pretty small group of 35, this actually is a viable communication channel to a lot of people. I, I worry that it's going to be fairly limited, even even with the amazing organizations and the work that they do. That's a very small subset of even just the nonprofits operating in our uh, in our city. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, Obviously, it's going to this task force is going to have to be well staffed with staffing resources. Um, we're also exploring bringing on um, a consultant, um, perhaps an, uh, an organization that is already out there doing a lot of recovery work or um, in um, the sphere of, of community development um, to help us, number one, devise the strategy around engagement and communication, and then to help us get the job done as well. And perhaps, you know, along the same lines as Council Member Perales was suggesting, there could be a committee or a solution group 
that's formed just around engagement and communication itself. And that might be the group of people who are most interested in this. And they're the ones who are really kind of focused, zeroed in on the information sharing. Yeah, I'd be interested to, to see more of our plans there as they evolve. I understand we're still pretty early, but I, I think if if the primary value was just generating policy recommendations, I'd be less worried about that. But given how much of the importance as we've stated it is actually on community engagement and communication, I just, I think that part of the strategy isn't super clear to me other than the point that, the very good point that the 35 members do work in many of the communities we wanna reach. I think that's fair, but kind of an incomplete strategy at this point. Um, I, I would also suggest that we consider, I'm not, I'm not articulating this to be part of the direction that we take when we vote here, but I, I would argue that at least for the recovery component of this, part of the recovery is gonna require new investments. And I, and I think we just, I didn't see these folks on the list, but I would consider groups like community foundations, even this may sound crazy, but even local banks. Like I, I would be thinking about people who are in a position to make investments. This Silicon Valley Community Foundation has $13.5 billion under management and is in our backyard. And I think often doesn't know in sufficient detail what's happening in their backyard. And so I just think having even one or two folks at the table who have the ability to suggest or unlock new investments in our community might just even as a learning experience for them might be a strategic thing for us to do. And if we don't want them to serve as one of the 35, maybe there's another way to keep them in the loop. But I just, I really think in the long run, we're gonna need new dollars. And I, I don't wanna bank entirely on federal stimulus to get us where we need to be. I think we're also gonna need philanthropic dollars. We're gonna need private sector investment. And I think having those folks in the conversation so they understand where we're trying to go and the impact they can have in our community, I think, I think could add a lot of value. So I just, I throw that out for consideration, not, not explicitly as direction, but I just wanted to share that point. And then finally, you mentioned the, you know, high amount of staff support that will be needed, which makes sense. But I just, I'm curious if we've quantified the staff investment. It's something I'm curious about with all of our projects on the roadmap is understanding trade-offs. And so I'm just curious, do we know the staffing levels and rough kind of hours or costs that this will take again not a reason not to do it but just would love to know for all the projects on the roadmap roughly what the what the cost side of the equation is yes thank you so we at this point we don't have um, a specific idea of how many staff hours it's going to take um, i will say that um, in any public participation process and i've been involved in several here in the city um, we know that it's it's a big lift for staff and it takes yeah. significant resources and hours and commitment. And so along those lines, um, we will be adding um, new staffing to the city manager's office um, on this recovery team to assist um, in, in, in this work. So we, we know that it's going to take significant resources. Great. Well, I, for one, at least hope that when we discuss at council, there's um, an estimate of, of the staff resources required and other, other investment. And that's something I'll advocate for for every, every project on the roadmap. To be clear, I'm not singling out this one, but I, just, I think it is important for us to understand relative trade-offs and costs of the, of the new projects that we're taking on. But um, appreciate the discussion, all the good ideas, and I'll be uh, looking forward to voting to support moving this forward. Great, thank you. Council Member Esparza. Thank you, I'll be quick, just a few things. So um, one, uh, just to be clear, I'm not trying to cut out a county office of ed um, on anything. Uh, and, and the point I was making was that we have relied on school districts that um, in area, particularly in areas that have been hardest hit by COVID. We've been relying on them to get rental assistance information out, vaccine information out, testing information out, digital equity, food, you know, all sorts of things um, in our response. And I think that in order to really have an equitable recovery that we look at that, um, one of the things I'm hearing 
a lot out in the community, for example, is um, it's just adorable to see all the back at school photos. I'm sure we've all like love them. It's the cutest thing. Um, seeing everybody so excited to be back at school. I, I know their parents are glad to have them be back at school. But, but the other thing that I'm hearing is the flip side of that is the anxiety, right? Kids that haven't um, been at school for a long time. Uh, they haven't seen their friends. Um, uh, some kids have become more introverted. Like, I don't want to lose sight of um, some of the, the needs if our goal is really stable families. Um, I wanted to make another point, which is our recovery should be centered in um, particularly in how we recover in an equitable approach that we focus on really hard hit areas and make sure that we lift people up because COVID, the impacts of COVID have been hugely inequitable. Um, and uh, some folks are gonna need a little bit more help. And that may mean another round of very highly targeted small business grants. It may be, um, it may be other things that we might have to do. I don't wanna just, I'm just throwing some stuff out, but we have to be very targeted. Um, one of the uh, things that I wanted to also bring up was um, I actually appreciate uh, Councilmember Mann's uh, comments about making sure that we bring in the philanthropic community. Um, I'll argue that the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, they don't actually have $13 billion at their disposal. They have a few million uh, dollars that they control, uh, but nonetheless, that they are um, a philanthropic player in our community, but we have other foundations, the Sobrato Foundation, we have um, corporate philanthropy, for example, I know um, uh, Applied focuses heavily on education, right? We have the Packard Foundation. We have, so that might be a subcommittee, right? Like how can we coordinate to get targeted reinvestments in that equitable recovery? Um, and, you know, lastly, I just wanted to make a point um, that, we really need to have a multicultural approach in this. Um, we need to ensure that we don't have um, expediency instead of equity, that we really bring on partners that intentionally look at investments that communities that have been hard hit by COVID specifically, um, and we listen to what they say. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean, because sometimes folks don't, you know, as um, I mean, I know you know, but um, uh, Council Member Carrasco and I represent uh, two sides of Story and King, right? Um, a historic intersection that means a lot to the community, has huge meaning to the east side, um, hard hit by COVID. Um, it's, those are small businesses that need door to door. And so we've done, our offices have done door to door outreach. I personally have been door to door to um, little Saigon, right? Helping get information about COVID grants during COVID. And so that's what I mean that we recognize that um, it isn't a one size fit all, um, that we are going to need to make certain types of investments. And if we're here to get that information, um, that we really intentionally listen to the needs of those neighborhoods um, in order to have that equitable recovery. And that that becomes the information that goes to the philanthropic communities, because I think a lot of them do want to listen to Councilmember Mann's point. They do want to listen. They do want to help. It's just, you know, uh, some of them are highly specialized. Others aren't. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we can provide um, really helpful information to them so that they can make those decisions. Um, and then lastly, I'm, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm super comfortable with the timeline moving that up. I think um, all of us have been working on COVID for over a year. I'm sure that if we just even um, made some phone calls to our partners, they have all, all sorts of thoughts and opinions on um, you know, what they've heard in the past 18 months in terms of you know, what investments need to be made in the community. I think I suspect that they're all going to be very eager to hit the ground running, and um, and I'm thankful for that. Th thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Councilmember Perales, I saw your hand raised earlier, and now it's down. Did you? 
Are you finished or you're done? Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Mahan. Yeah, thanks. I'll be really quick. And I, I think I agree with everything Council Member Sparks just said. I did, just as a kind of point of fact, just want to note, I mean, I, I don't know that it really matters. I'm fine with Sobrato or any other local foundation, but I do, I happen to serve on a board for a couple of years with the new, um, relatively new CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. They, they do have $13.5 billion under management, and then they disperse about $1.3 billion per year. The thing that I think is noteworthy, just worth sharing, is historically of the, of the $1.3 billion that's dispersed in the last year and every year, right, it's most, a lot of that has been out of the region. It's been international. It's been, and, and I think under Nicole's new leadership, there's been a, a refocusing locally, which I think is a huge opportunity for us. I think there's now an emphasis on paying more attention to what's happening in our in our backyard, and there's really significant funds that are that are starting to be reallocated from international to, to local initiatives. So I just I just wanted to flag that. But again, I don't particular. I mean, I think there are multiple local foundations who are worth reaching out to. And that's Great. all I had, Chair. Okay, thank you. Let's vote. Oh, Chair. I'm sorry, I can't find my little hand uh, button right now. Can I just say oh, a couple of okay. words? Please? Yes, please, of course. I'm, I'm sorry, you know what? I'm gonna have, you're gonna have to skip me. Uh, other than, cause I, I'm getting my daughter a COVID test of all things, I apologize. No worries. Sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you. Let's vote. Roscoe? Corrales? Aye, aye. Sorry, Corrales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that good discussion around the task force. I look forward to the report in January. Next is a report on the citywide residential anti-disbursement strategy verbal report. This is a quarter report that I see Reagan has unmuted herself and she's ready. You're ready to go, I assume. Great, thank you. Hello, council member, thank you. Reagan Henninger here with the housing department. I'm also here with Jackie morales Ferrand, our director, along with Kristen Clements, who is our division manager over our policy team. And this is our quarterly update on our residential anti-displacement strategy. Next slide. So you'll recall last September, the council prioritized four recommendations that we'll update you on today. Next slide. So one of the primary focuses of the department's COVID recovery work is leading the emergency rental assistance program in coordination with the county. Uh, we, there's a state program and a local program. And this work was not only prioritized as part of the department's anti-displacement work, but also prioritized again in June as part of the citywide roadmap. So using US Treasury emergency rental assistance round one funds, the state has 57 million dedicated to Santa Clara County for rental assistance. Back in February, the council approved a hybrid approach where the state runs a rental assistance program for landlords and households who are above 30% of AMI. And the state program launched on March 15th. And you'll see here that they have just over 3,200 applications totaling 43 million. Next slide. So the local program managed by the city, the county's Office of Supportive Housing, Destination Home, Sacred Heart, and 46 grassroots partners launched in May. And this local program is focused on extremely low income households in areas that are heavily impacted by COVID-19. The local program launched in May and in San Jose, we have just over 2,700 applications, totaling 27 million. And here are, these are the top four zip codes that are accessing the program in San Jose. Next slide. 
So critical to the rental assistance program is the eviction moratoria and having protections in place while the rental assistance programs get the funding dispersed to our most vulnerable households is essential. And the state moratorium expires September 30th. So the administration will return to council in September with an update on what actions, if any, can be taken. And slides. So with the end of the moratorium, Coming in September, we're making every effort to get the rental assistance funding dispersed as quickly as possible. We're expanding capacity, particularly in on the front end on helping as many households as we can complete their applications. The City Hall Rental Assistance Help Center opened three weeks ago, and we are opening a second Help Center at Franklin McKinley School District this week. Last week and this week, temporary staff from the vaccine sites have moved over to the housing department to work at the rental assistance centers, both at City Hall and the Franklin McKinley location. The county has added disaster service workers who are now providing assistance with application completion, but also on the back end with application review and approval. And nine additional nonprofit partner agencies have been able to add capacity in either application um, submittals or application review and approval. And finally, we're working with the Law Foundation to expand their capacity to provide legal support. So we'll be using American Rescue Plan funds uh, to fund about a 40% increase in legal services. And now I'll turn it over to Kristen to give an update on our tenant preference work, COPA and the Housing Commission. Oh, Kristen, we can't hear you for some reason. <laughs> Kristen, are you there? She's working on it. I think she's gonna call in. Okay. In the meantime, I can jump in until she joins Thank the call. This Feel is, free, Jackie. This is Jackie morales Rand. I'm the director of the housing department. And about the, and Kristen, if you come on, just feel to jump in, jump in and I will stop talking. So we have tried to move forward our te tenant preferences work. So one of the things we did is we worked with Cortese to uh, initiate some legislation. Unfortunately, the bill did not make it through this year, but has become a two-year bill. And, and so the hope is that we'll be able to get it over the goal line next year. This will help us to be able to use tenant preferences locally by ensuring that um, the state has recognized the need for this type of work. We've also been working very closely with the Housing Community Development uh, Department, which is the state housing department. And we had had high hopes that because the director uh, came from the Obama administration and worked in fair housing, that he would be very open to working with us on this issue. And he is very open, but the challenge is, is he has clear uh, uh, concerns regarding how communities might use these types of preferences to be exclusive instead of inclusive. And Jackie, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jackie. I see that Kristen is signed up as an attendee. So uh, do you want to continue or should I go to her? Go ahead and go to her and I'll let her pick up right now. Thank okay, you. Okay, great, thank you. Chair, this is Mike, uh, staff support. I moved Kristen over to panelist. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. I, I apologize for that. Um, 
So I heard Jackie talking about our work with the state on tenant preferences. And again, the director is very knowledgeable about this topic. And we met with staff about three weeks ago on how to best accelerate this work. They are, they are supposedly giving more guidance over the next, they said three to four months on how uh, cities could do analysis and how they could get comfortable with it. But um, we have been working with them ongoing. They know we're a good actor and um, they intend to you know, work with us cooperatively on this. It's just that they had budget priorities and homelessness funding to get out and um, lots of other things going on as we all do. So unfortunately, while we have been working with the state on the analysis that they want to see, our project in Mayfair, Ketzel Gardens, that has both local and state money, did get built and it did get leased up. The project had approximately 3,000 applications for the 42 units that are non-homeless housing. Those homeless units get a direct referral um, through our continuum of care uh, vulnerability index. But for the 42 units, um, there were 350 applications from zip code 95116. There were over 200 residents that Somos Mayfair tried to help directly to apply and get their applications ready. And unfortunately, no one was successful in that, in competing in that avalanche of applications. It was 70 to one uh, in terms of demand and supply for the applications for the family units. So this example proves the need uh, that preferences, you know, you can't substitute anything else for this prioritized list. And HCD staff actually said, please write this up. I'd be happy to move this forward as an example of a community trying to do this the right way. Um, and really nothing else would substitute for the preference. So that case study did go over to them and we're hope hoping that that accelerates the director's attention on this issue. So um, in addition to the HCD basic analysis, of course, the bill that we're working on, they would need to sign off on because they are the subject matter expert for the governor on the bill. Um, so really all roads do lead to, to, uh, to the state. And in the meantime, we are getting together systems where we can capture protected class information to analyze, to make our data sources better and able to analyze the way that the state will dictate. The community opportunity to purchase work that we've been doing, uh, we've been working very hard at a, a variety of outreach events with uh, a wide variety of stakeholders. This slide shows the 38 organizations regularly represented at our technical advisory committee meetings, which are happening one to two times a month, and our stakeholder advisory committee meetings, which are open to the public and much broader. Um, other folks have come sporadically. I didn't list those organizations here. And of course, many members of the public come to the stakeholder advisory meetings to make their views known as well. So it's that is. Um, the, the, we're using the TAC as in help in designing the technical uh, aspects of the program proposal and the stakeholder advisory group to keep them informed and get their feedback too. For the TAC, we've held five out of seven planned meetings and we've got a Q&A session for them this week. Um, you know, if they have any burning issues, they're not getting answers to yet. Um, for the SAC, we've held four out of five planned meetings focusing on COPA for this. This organization we actually hope lives beyond COPA. As we've heard, that's a best practice in community members meeting together and making progress on anti-displacement strategies over the long term. So looking forward on COPA, we are continuing and I'm um, trying to get very focused in our other stakeholder meetings that add information to the program design through the fall. And uh, this will help us put together draft program parameters so that we can get more feedback from the general public. Um, meanwhile, Somos Mayfair had run their own process 
where they held four geographic meetings through the city and um, got residents feedback as well. And they are feeding that feedback into our process. Um, our staff also talked with other cities in a regional convening um, that are also working on some kind of similar program development to get updates on their thoughts and what they are putting together. So that was really interesting as well. We're putting up a webpage to let people know more information and the plan is to return to CEDC late this year and then city council early next year. Uh, finally, recommendation four on the anti-displacement strategy is to increase equitable representation on commissions. The first task is to add the new seat to the Housing and Community Development Commission for individuals with lived experience of homelessness. Staff has been looking at other cities to find out good models for how to bring these people on and what kind of support that they need to be, um, you know, focused and productive and compensated for their time. And in addition, we are looking also at other underrepresented groups um, that may not have been on HCDC in the recent past and thinking about the optimal number of seats. But first our priority is to get that lived experience seat um, to be created and filled while we go through more work long-term. So over the next three months, as Reagan said, until we see you again for a quarterly update, we're focusing hard on emergency rental assistance and making sure as many people and landlords apply as possible to either the state program or the local. Um, we're, we've stood up and we'll be operating the eviction help centers. We just hired a new staff member to oversee those help centers operation. We'll return back to council next month regarding the eviction moratorium for the COVID response. For tenant preferences, as I said, as I said that two-year bill will continue to see iterations on language and we'll be working with stakeholders to get them comfortable. We'll be working and hoping to hear from the state on their progress, but also in the meantime, we'll be using tools that they have released for purposes of the housing element that can be brought over to this tenant preferences analysis and hopefully done in a way that the state will approve of. And uh, working with the city attorney the whole way and while we're waiting, we could also draft a, a city ordinance and create updated findings as to why this is necessary. For the community opportunity to purchase, we are continuing our working group meetings with the idea that we'll be wrapping up research and those general meetings in October, um, following up with stakeholders on specific items and helping to, you know, developing a draft framework that we'll start to test with them and then take a little bit more public to get wider outreach and feedback. We are also putting up a web page for this work so that the public can be more apprised of what COPA is and is not. I think there's some <laughs> misconceptions out there as to what we're doing. So we want to make sure that we are transparent about this work. And finally, progressing more on the lived experience commissioner with the idea that we will come back with a municipal code amendment to add the seat and, um, and the steps necessary to, um, to board that lived experience commissioner as a priority. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Reagan, Kristen, and Jackie for your presentation. First, I'm going to turn to members of the public for their comments or questions re or comments regarding this item. Tessa Woodmansey. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, the displacement that we're talking about is so widespread with all of our climate crisis bringing in so many people into our community that are climate refugees that we're experiencing, that the science is 
not even able to, you know, things are so off the scale. What we saw in Tennessee, the 17 inches of rain, that what we're seeing in the Northwest where the, the, the temperature was 30 degrees above normal. So, I mean, there, it's, everything is like out of control in terms of the climate because of how we're living and that we're not really addressing that issue. And that's when, because we are in that crisis. And when we are dealing with displacement, I also think of the displacement of all the animals that are, are at risk, are, are, um, are pollinators. And we have to really think about that in terms of even our housing, we need to be developing programs where we're growing food and learning to take care of nature as our main uh, main issue. No longer economic development, gross, gross domestic product. It has to be taking care of each other and nature as our primary goal. And that doesn't mean giving money to small businesses because that is a an, a an abstraction to get money, to get the coin so that you can have housing and you can have food. We need to get back to basics where we're providing housing. We have, we have uh, it's not housing, but I was thinking providing food for ourselves. It's called agency. That's the true agency. And to give the coin to say, yeah, you go work in a restaurant, you go get COVID, you know, and we'll give you the coin. I mean, the, the choices people are having to make now are between life and death because, you know, I, I need food and I need clothing and shelter and I got to get this coin, but I have to expose my Myself to COVID. So we need to have everything more direct. It needs to be back to basics. And that's where I say we need to buy this property at 615 Stockton Avenue as a, um, a, as a demonstration project of growing food. And everybody needs to grow food. I talked to my neighbor who's from the Filipina. She's a Filipina. She says that's how it is in the Philippines. Throughout the whole curriculum, K through 12, you are learning to grow food. Isn't that smart? Isn't that, doesn't that make sense that we do that? And yet we don't do that. The basics, we're not learning the basics. So that's why I say it's a demonstration project. We don't see people growing food. We need to learn to do that. And every, every student needs to have that as their homeschooling project of growing food on their land. Hey, thank you. Phone number 5140, Michael Sincini. There, there's no getting out of this. There's no way you're going to be able to put a, a Band-Aid on the ridiculous rent moratoriums. And all. You're not going to be able to do it. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be, ever be able to have enough low-income housing in a place where houses that cost $1.2 million are fixer-uppers. It's not going to happen. And the people who are in line to get the, the free or cheap housing, they know somebody. So what you're trying to sell is something that isn't there. And remember who told you, caller 5140, right? There's no amount of taxation or government – what, you're going to have three, four different layers of government giving money so you can have a crappy little apartment or what? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You, you are fooling the public. You're, you're, it, it, it's not going to happen. You guys are not planning this out correctly, and Joe Biden is not going to help you. You see how he helps people? Not very well. And you voted for him, Pam. You voted for him. And uh, you're going to see what the federal government does for you. Absolutely nothing because they already have your votes. They already have you figured out. They already have, they've already brainwashed you enough to keep voting for them. So they don't have to give you anything. And if they give you something – it's going to be the crumb that Nancy Pelosi maybe maybe kicks down to uh, Santa Clara County after she gets done helping all of her friends in San Francisco and Sonoma. But you'll see. There'll be no housing for anybody. There won't be anything for anybody because no one's going to be able to live here or afford to live here. People who are medical doctors can't live here. How is somebody who has a minimum wage job supposed to survive here? It's not going to happen. It's not in the cars. The cost of everything is too high. Utilities gas, everything. How, how are people going to be able to afford to live for you? You don't, you don't get it because you're in real estate, Pam, and you own plenty Thank of you. it. Next is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. First of all, uh, thank you for the exclusion of the bell, uh, Councilwoman uh, Foley. Um, the, for, uh, Councilwoman Esparza, thank you. You're, you're centering the conversation. You're, you're, you're being as delicate and as, 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 as a diplomatic as you possibly can. I sense that. And I just want to extend my gratitude to you for trying to sound the warning bell about what it is that we're actually dealing with. 
that meeting that happened last week, we already have right now the emergency policy set in place. The dude said straight up the next 12 months, we are going to be in this mode, which means they know, they know. And that was a warning right there in last week's meeting. Now, with that said, what my question to the to the to uh, um, to Jackie, Kristen, and, and Reagan, and thank you uh, for the report and, and and the analysis. But has there been any analysis with respect to a house building moratorium? We have to stop this bleeding. We we can't just think, okay, we're we're just gonna build and build and build and build and build and build, and then let's just see what happens. Oh my God! Over here, look. Oh, there's a bunch of homeless people. Oh well, let's deal with that. My question to the housing department is: Has there been any analysis with respect to the possibility of having a housing moratorium with respect to all the developers, so that the city can uh, can acclimate to the, the 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 housing stock now, and and so that it so that, so that it can breathe because the acceleration is going to increase exponentially. In the next five years, there's going to be at least an exodus of 150,000 people leaving this, leaving the city, and most of them, Chicanos, Mexicanos, Latinos, and Negros. Thank you, Blair Beekman. All right, Blair Beekman here. Thank you uh, for this item. Yeah, thank you for the words of Council Person as far as uh, we've got a new uh, Lambda variant going starting apparently. And we do have a pretty tough fall. We're gonna to have to watch ourselves carefully. And this isn't May, this isn't the wonders of May. Uh, but thank you, for, thank you for your work and efforts. Uh, I think it's always important that I need to state uh, for items like this that, uh, you know, uh, for the counties of Santa Clara and Alameda, 90 days after December 31st, 2021, that's when uh, the eviction moratorium ends in those two counties. Counties have a, a certain precedence over state eviction moratorium things. So March, 2022 is the, when the eviction moratorium ends for Santa Clara County and Alameda County. Now it's from that I'm understanding that because of the state, there's some state eviction moratorium things that are ending at the end of September. That means that uh, owners can, can sue uh, tenants at that time. And that's what Jackie and, and the housing department's gonna really hustle and try to figure stuff out at the local level, how that doesn't have to happen. Good luck in those efforts. As I've tried to say, good luck in, um, you know, a, as a city council, we can uh, vote to, uh, you know, for emergency measures at that time to make emergency uh, asks. Uh, with 30 seconds left, um, you know, I keep trying to say this is a time of subsidy. We really have to be, knowing how to talk about the issues of subsidy with our community and community needs to know how to ask questions. And we can't be ruled by, you know, really bad subsidy programs or choices. They have to be idealistic. Um, there, there's new housing development programs coming down uh, to help uh, with transitional housing for homeless. Uh, it's amazing subsidy stuff. Be ready for it be, and let us prepare for it. Thank you. Thank you. Returning to the committee. Are there any questions? Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Chair. Um, can we go back to slide four briefly? Thanks. Sorry, which slide? Slide four, I believe it is. It's the, the local rental assistance. Oh. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. So for local, I noticed on the previous slide, which is the state program, we had basically a ratio of requested versus delivered. Do we know that number locally of the 27 million requested? Do we know how many we've actually gotten out to applicants? Paid a little over 1100. 
Sorry, Reagan, I, I, at least I didn't get the beginning of that. Can you say that sure. Locally, we've paid over a little over 1100. 11 million? I'm saying of the 27 million that's been requested, do we know how much we've deployed thus far? Is that 1100 residents, 11, so Reagan? We've paid 1100 applications. Of the 27, 100? Um, yes, and then that totals a little over 11 million. Got it. Okay, right. And that makes sense because it's about 10,000 per, per request. Okay, got it. So we're at about, we've deployed a little more than a third of what's been requested. And then we have the requested number here, but what's the total amount we have access to for the local program? The local program for fate for ERA one is about 60 million. Okay. So we've seen, okay, I just wanted to understand the ratio. So of, of what we at least have accessible thus far, we've had requests for about half of it. And then we've deployed a little more than a third of that. And do we know just out of curiosity, kind of roughly relative to the need? I mean, my sense was that even if we deployed every last dollar, we would be far short of the need. So we're, there's sort of, I'm sort of thinking of this as a giant funnel. There's all the folks who need the assistance, there's how many have actually applied and then there's how many have gotten dollars. And I'm just, I'm curious, maybe we don't, maybe we don't have to do this now because it would be complicated. You may not have all the data, but it would be interesting to think of it as a funnel and understand where, where we can have the biggest impact on getting more, more dollars out to more people. It sounds like we're still, we still have quite a backlog that we're processing. Is that right? Say the backlogs are in two places. Um, getting people to actually complete the application and then the review and approval. Okay. So we're estimating there's about 27,000 households countywide that are in need of some form of rental assistance. And then we do have an info memo that's coming this week that will have some of this analysis that you're after, council member. Cool. That's great. Yeah, I remember we discussed that um, at council recently and that that was coming. So that's, that's exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Okay. That's great. Well, I know it's not easy. So I appreciate all the work trying to get those dollars out the door. I'll, I'll wait for the info memo. I, I do think it's, I'm sure we all know this. I think it's probably the most important thing we can get right this year to avert a local a crisis for so many people. Um, Okay, and then on COPA, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions just about process at this point. Do we, uh, for the stakeholder meetings that were noted, are, what, what's the attendance like? Are we consistently seeing participation from the different stakeholder groups or is that not been the case? Um, yes, thanks council member. The, the stakeholder, the advisory group, the larger group, we've consistently been seeing 30 to 40 people um, it started out a little bit bigger. Um, so for instance, we had a couple of business groups come at the beginning and then they realized this was about residential and they didn't come back. Um, Makes sense. We're encouraging, we're trying to also strike a balance of the types of voices there, but still open it to the public. So we've been happy that we've had a consistent participation level. I think it went slightly under 30 this time, but it is reportedly vacation time for many right before school starts or around that time. So we think it's gonna pick up again in September. Okay, great. I'm really glad to hear that. And then I'm curious for the, for the existing market participants for whom this would be a change of process, do we have a sense, can you tell us a little bit about at a high level what you're hearing from them? So, so for the property owners, landlords, brokers for whom we'd be imposing a new process do we know how they're feeling about that at this point yeah there's been a lot of discussion we've got program design elements that we've been trying to structure questions around i think the biggest debate is about the um, number of units in a building that it would apply to and i think um you know because one to four units 
are generally listed on the MLS listing service, but five units and up are not. Um, and so the number of units interacts really closely with what somebody might want to do with a building too. And so for instance, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, you asked about the market participants. Well, well no, that, I mean, that's, state focused. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting feedback. I mean, the small landlords as well. I mean, I guess I'm just curious for, for people who are currently out there buying, selling, owning property, we're, we're talking about an, uh, some new requirements. And I'm just always curious to hear what they see as the, the impacts and potential unintended consequences, or if, if, if this makes a lot of sense to them and they don't, they, they mm -hmm. embrace it. I'm just curious to get kind of a flavor for what kind mm -hmm. of feedback we're hearing so far. Well, I think we've heard that, you know, there are other requirements when somebody sells their property. So for instance, you have to disclose if there are toxics on the soil as an example. Um, and so part of the conversation is about what parties need to do what functions. And so would it be the owner who would be on the hook to disclose or to do the process the correct way with their realtor who may be local or maybe in from another market? If it's a just a small building, um, would they have to come up to speed? And you know, what would that outreach look like? What would that, um, how would we work on that together if you know not just local entities would need to know about this but also those who might come in from outside of the market and and how would we do that outreach later on um, so i know that's been a, a good topic of conversation um, there's been a lot of interesting real estate conversation about the levels about the budget and about um, if you acquire do you have money for rehab if you're also targeting very low income residents, you know, how do those numbers work out? So I think a lot of this has been getting comfortable around the concepts about preservation and rehab funding, um, but also people just wanting to make sure that um, if an offer is made, would it be a qualified entity making the offer? Would the offer be likely to come through if it were made? How could we make sure that the process doesn't get um, interfered with? you know, by somebody else kind of coming in and just like lobbing some ridiculous offer in the middle of something like that's not at all what we intend. That is something we would be designing to prevent. And so the conversation again is how can the offers be credible? How can we know that the entities making them are qualified? And what does that look like? So we've been talking to the lending community too, just about the need for quick closing acquisition funding. And, um, you know, in other cities, uh, an entity outside of the city provides that. So, right. so lots of like probably eight to 10 core program elements that we've been discussing and lots of interest and thoughts on all different sides. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, I really appreciate yeah. the extra context. It's good to understand how those conversations are progressing as, as we continue to think about COPA. So, um, Appreciate it. That's really helpful and look forward Thanks. to hearing more soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, member. Uh, Council member Mahan, is that you finished? Yes, okay. thank you, Chair. Then I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and move. Sorry, I should have ended by moving acceptance of the report, assuming we need to do that. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Council member Esparza. You're next. Thanks. Um, I uh, wanted to start um, on, uh, just since Council Member Mann pulled slide four, um, I just wanted to offer a comment, which is, I think it's tremendous work within our county city folks who have been able to get out almost uh, as much money as the state effort with far less um, people, but it shows we're closer to the ground. The other thing that shows where we're close to the ground and that's reflecting actual needs is I'm always um, really moved by how the our local rental assistance efforts have mirrored COVID cases. So these zip codes are the hardest hit zip codes for COVID and they're the, the zip codes that are getting the most rental assistance. And so it's just, it, to me, it's just another indicator that our um, our partnerships um, 
the, our process is working, that we are in those neighborhoods. We're listening to folks that need it. And so I just wanted to comment on that. Um, I had um, a couple of questions on um, slide six. Um, you mentioned um, capacity for legal services. I, I had a question on um, the legal services slide. So it says legal services, nonprofit partners, limited capacity. I hear that all day, every day um, in my district as well. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we're adding capacity to that? You mentioned the um, contract with the Law Foundation. What, what exactly is that, um, is that added capacity look like? So we um, just last week came to, um, I guess, a conceptual agreement with the Law Foundation on what it will look like and how much it will cost, but it's a pretty big ramp up. They'll be hiring um, attorneys. They'll also be hiring, um, or I should say adding capacity to supervise pro bono efforts, because we know that's an area where I think we can utilize existing um, resources, but it does take some management to, you know, um, oversee people who are doing pro bono work. Um, and they'll also be having um, representation in our two help center locations so that someone who's accessing the rental assistance can also um, get legal services. Okay. And um, so are we... Uh, so I, I understand that that's conceptual, <laughs> but are we, is that strictly for supervision and pro bono? And the reason I'm asking is I've, I've heard that they're stretched and that the resources out there and not just the Law Foundation, but we don't have a lot of resources. So the bench is, is a small one. Um, and, and so, you know, I hear from my residents um, and all sorts of hinky things have gone on during the pandemic in communities like mine. And, um, and so just from my point of view, I see that they're stretched. And um, I think that needs a lot more than just pro bono work. Um, and so I just wanted to find out what are we adding to that? I think it's awesome that there's enough pro yeah, bono work right out there. Right before I said pro bono, I said they're adding attorneys. They're adding okay. staff attorneys. So they'll okay. be adding about um 12 new attorneys and for the law oh, wow. foundation that's very significant that's right huge yeah um three supervisors they'll be adding five community housing advocates a case manager um and this is in addition to that support for the pro bono work so it's like i said it's about a 40 percent wrap ramp up of what legal services they're currently offering so um, can you, so that's nine positions, 12. Can you explain what an advocate is? Is that um, someone who's representing someone legally that needs help? Or is that someone who's doing community outreach? Um, it's definitely, I don't think it's someone that's, it's not an attorney. So it's not someone that's representing them in court. Um, but I don't, because this is conceptual council member, I'm not sure I can talk to the specifics yeah. of like what. Okay. Uh, all right. I won't put you on the spot. But a housing I, advocate, what their job description is. We haven't gotten that far yet. So, so I'll, I'll give you my two cents just because my, again, my community has been hard hit as you, you, the housing department's very well aware of some of the nutty stuff that has gone on in, um, in my district, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is seeing who can actually provide legal assistance. I'm not sure having somebody hand out, and I don't know if, if this is or what it is or is not, but I'm not sure somebody handing out flyers um, or telling somebody what their rights are if we don't have the bodies on the other end to enforce those rights. To me, that's more important because um, I see situations where um, you know, there are people who definitely are doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing, and they're doing them anyway, because 
where you know there's very little enforcement right there and there and there's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the community and there are some bad actors who are taking advantage of that not by any means is that the majority um, of landlords who are doing that but we know who they are and um that's where we need some additional support um and uh so my concern is that we make sure that we have actual attorneys who can actually help folks um, that need it um, to, to keep them from you know, having their rights violated. Um, and so, so I did want to throw that out. I'm happy to see a big increase in that. I just want to make sure that it's going to enforcing those rights, um, not necessarily like community outreach is great. We have, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. And, and fortunately in the pandemic, we've seen um, organizations that have been just incredible at doing outreach in, in the community, especially in hard hit neighborhoods. And that's been great, but they can't do legal work. <laughs> so, so that's yeah, what we really need. We agree. Um, the legal services is where we really wanted to see the increase um, I don't know much about a community housing advocate other than, you know, I think they do intake so that uh, okay. an yeah. attorney is not doing intake. Sure. Uh, they can do some like briefings and some legal services under the supervision of an attorney. Um, so I think it's more work that um, maybe okay. is more efficient if the attorney is not actually doing okay, it. Okay, that's helpful. That's why I asked. I, I'm not clear um, on that, uh, you know, what that position does either. So I just wanted to emphasize um, the need. So that's great to hear. Um, thank you. Um, you know, we have discussions at council all the time about, you know, some people don't deal with that. And, and then I see, you know, some developments in my district that are managed by folks who consistently um, do some some things they shouldn't be and that they know that and and so that's where we need that enforcement arm so that we focus on that um instead you know anyway i'll just leave it there um thank you that's great to hear um and those legal services are needed um i had a question um and thanks to council member man who asked a lot of copa questions i think that was really helpful um, I, so I won't repeat those. Um, I had a question on, um, the, uh, compensation plans. So for example, um, I have one of the low income appointments on, um, our housing commission. So, um, I also know, um, and I won't speak for the mobile home park resident, um, but I do know that many folks in GSMOL who are very active, um, I, I can think of some in my district who are uh, seniors, um, couples who live off of less than 30,000 a year. Um, and so uh, are we reviewing those compensation plans for the low income seat as well, or for folks that fall in that category. Um, thanks, Council Member. And I don't know. And I don't know. Yeah, I know. I see which, you twice. Which unmute. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I don't know if Jackie is there and wants to comment on this. Um, I do think that that was the thought that, um, especially if the lived experience commissioner does need some compensation, of course, to pay for travel once we travel again or some kind of um, hookup ability. If they are not able to do Zoom today, they would need to be able to do Zoom as a commissioner. And so um, I think they're looking at a range of ideas, but I agree with you that the lower income um, members of our commission, um, I'm sure that they sometimes struggle with some of the added costs. So for instance, you know, printing costs or um, transit costs. So I don't know if Jackie wants to comment about the low income commissioners in general. Yes, so I think actually our attorneys advised us to not make it 
just to isolate the one category, but really to be broader because there could be some uh, concerns by just offering one benefit to one group and not benefit not offering it to another. And so, yes, we will look at it more broadly than just the homeless appointment. Okay, thank you. That's great to hear. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Council Member Perales. Hi, thank you. Just a quick question. Um, I know this is a quarterly report and this one's verbal. Um, can you remind me when you may be coming back with a, with a written report on this? Um, yes, I can take that. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, this report was verbal, and um, going forward, I think we're going to be doing all written reports so that members of the public can, if they miss this or don't want to watch a video, can quickly go pull down a memo and get an update. So the next quarter, which I think is scheduled for November, would be with a written memo and then and then thereafter. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, there's just a lot of obviously material here and um, I appreciate you putting together the PowerPoint slide, um, but there's definitely a lot to cover and, and it would be nice to have something in writing to reference back to. So that was it. Thank you. I appreciate the update. Thank, Thank you. I, I agree with having this in writing. It's very helpful when it is. Uh, I just have a couple of questions regarding COPA and also about the uh, rental disbursement assistance. But so Regan, I'll start with that, the rental uh, disbursement. Um, it's a slow process. And you mentioned that a couple of the stumbling blocks are the completing the application. Is it a matter of having documentation to sit down with you or sit down and complete the application? Or does it require input from several parties and the application applicant isn't getting the cooperation what what's the number one issue at the at the application level that you're seeing is the issue and how can we help resolve that i think it's um people who can help a household complete the application and so it doesn't there's not a ton of documentation that's required. We've tried to streamline the application. It's really, um, and people can go online and complete it themselves. Um, they don't need someone to sit with them. Uh, but however, knowing the local program is focused on our most vulnerable and also um, in these, you know, extremely low income households and and um, we find that their situation is not is often not that straightforward. They may not have a traditional lease or their um, income is sort they may, for example, clean houses and their income may go up and down. Um, so it takes a bit of time to kind of figure out what, what their income is. Um, so it's really the people who can work with these, you know, really vulnerable households who um, may need just that additional support to get that application in. So that is why the county has added disaster service workers redeployed from their day jobs to help people complete applications um, we have taken those uh, temporary employees who were working at vaccine sites, they're now housing department employees and are staffing um, the City Hall Help Center as well as the Franklin McKinley Help Center. And we uh, have made a request to our EOC since it is reactivated to also get some redeployed city employees to come and help with application um, completing applications. Thank you. I can imagine the uh, application process is intimidating to uh, anyone because it's a level of bureaucracy. You have to have access to the to the internet in order to process your application, and then you have to 
have confidence or, or the desire or will to believe that you're going to get some funds and assistance through this. So I can imagine there's a lot of frustration. So the, the savvy tenant may be able to navigate the system or if they have someone in their home who is savvy and can help them through. You know what would be helpful for me is if, and, and maybe for my colleagues, is to see what is required at, at application. Just is there a checklist that you could send to us without too much difficulty? That would be really helpful. I'd just like to see what kind of things we're asking for people so that when we get asked about rental assistance, that we can say, hey, you should have these documents ready for you because those are the ones you're going, going to need. In, in, as I think about rental assistance, and I think this is great that all of this money is available, but of course, deploying it, getting it out there is what is the end game. That's what we want to see. Do we have uh, people being turned down because they make too much money as tenants? I've heard tenants say that. In our, they're just not paying their landlord. Landlords are frustrated. They make a lot of money. You know, maybe they're in high tech and they're just skirting the law because they can, but they're waiting for assistance. Yeah, I think um, we try and do a warm handoff between the okay. local program and the state program. So someone could be a higher than ELI income, but we would just refer them to the state program. Okay, so we're not... That's that makes sense because our limited our resources are limited. So yeah, and frankly, you know, if someone is thirty two percent of AMI, we're not turning them away. We're helping them. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, then you also mentioned that. Uh, oh, I remember another question about a, a qualified tenant. If you rent a room in uh, a home you may not have a rental agreement or a lease, yet you're unable to pay your rent and so your landlord isn't getting your rental income. Are you, do that? would they qualify and what kind of documentation would they need to show that they rent? A letter from the rent of the landlord or? We can assist them. Um, if they have a letter from the landlord, that's great, but we can also make uh, self, self testimonies or self declarations um, also. Okay, so you're working to help as much as possible folks navigate the system and get, get the assist financial assistance they need. That's great. That's great. Really, that's what it's, that's what it's all about. Thank you, Reagan. Kristen, I have some questions for you regarding COPA. You had mentioned um, that you're going to have some sort of the details worked out by, by uh, in October or general October timeline. Is that when it's coming back to council? It was my understanding that we would see the design elements and the implement, implementations and approve that before it went out to the public. Is that still the expectation? Oops. Yes, Chair, that's still the expectation. We, okay. And on when the do you agenda we, on the work plan? Oops, you're cutting in and out. And I'm not sure which one to look at. That's okay. <laughs> Can you restate that? We're coming to CEDC first. Okay. And, and so. So you're coming to CED before we go, you go to the council. Okay. Question for you on, um, on the design, you would mention one to four units. Are we looking at one, uh, one unit rental properties? We had not um, in our outreach banned any size unit from discussion. Although the city council direction is to look carefully at five to 50. So what I wanted to do was to ask questions to know enough that five to 50 is the best range. And, um, you know, if for some reason we thought that that should be tweaked a little bit, we would have the rationales we came back to why. Okay. That's helpful because uh, initially when this work came to us and then forward to council to look at, 
I had always considered it would be mid-range developments and not single family. Because if you're dealing with single family, you're also dealing with townhomes and condominiums as rentals. So, and and what's right. the, and, and, and while they're more affordable, that doesn't really get to the housing need of multifamily dwellings. It, it, it helps, but it doesn't get to the, fu the final need. Okay, well, I my only question was when you, uh, if it was coming back to us and it is. So that's, that yeah. is it for me. Council Member Sparza, you still have your hand raised. Yeah, yeah, I lowered it and raised it. Just one quick um, comment, which is uh, that um, Council Member Foley, you asked a lot of good questions on the paperwork and, you know, how you do this and how you do that. And I think, you know, as I was hearing you ask very reasonable questions, um, it just reminded me how important the work of the Help Center is um, and the there are going to be pop-ups, right? Because I think we can help people so much and then we have to, I think, refer, we've been referring folks to nonprofit partners, but I think that's what makes the work of this help center so important is people, there's so many, um, you know, non-traditional situations and people have a lot of questions and paperwork um, and there are going to be other pop-ups is that correct, Reagan, um, throughout the city? So I think um, it just shows how important that work is because there's so many people and so many situations that make people fall through the cracks. And we're in the lucky position of being able to help them. We just need to get through whatever that barrier is, whether it's um, signing a form or um, bringing some paperwork or being, you know, anyway, uh, it's hugely important work. So thank you for highlighting that. That's it. Thanks. I I appreciate that, and and uh, Reagan, I remembered at our council meeting last week, you talked about pop-ups, and I mentioned them to my staff because we have a couple of events coming up, and it would be nice to have you present, so hopefully they've reached out to you or they're in the process of reaching out to you to have a pop-up or two at one of our two um, Viva Park and, and other events that are coming into District 9, because while this need is... Uh, concentrated in certain areas of the district or the city. It, the need is actually of all over the city, uh, just not perhaps as big or as well known as it is in council member Sparza's district and others, other districts. So of course we need to take care of those in greatest need, but I know there are people out there in district nine who are hurting too. All right, with that, uh, if there's no more comments, let's vote. Yes, Carrasco? thank you. Aye. Corrales? Yes. Mayhem? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our meeting. We do have a uh, time for open forum. And so I will move to open forum right now. This is your opportunity for the members of the public to speak on any item uh, that you wish to um, make a comment about. Uh, the first is uh, Tessa Woodmansey. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm an alarmist and it's a good thing because it's very alarming what is happening to us. The um, Everything is off the scales and what it means is that the scientists are all saying it's off the scales, it's out of their range when we have 17 inches of rain in Tennessee and 30 degrees anomaly in the Northwest. So what that is showing is that all of us are vulnerable. And the science is saying it over and over that we are all vulnerable to the climate crisis because our climate, it looks really nice out there, but it's not gonna be that way. And we're not preparing. And that's what you're talking about resiliency, but it's not happening. It's all BS because resiliency does come from urban sustainability and we have to start growing food locally and we have to start putting our mouth where our, our money where our mouth is. And, you know, when we talk about equity, we do have to look at the, the places that have um, the fossil fuels have impacted the pollution that has impacted and grow the food locally there because that is the only it's called an ecological economy that we need and that it needs to be hyper local and we have all our needs met by our ourselves 
and our neighbors. Now that doesn't support our, your capitalist, ca capitalistic nightmare that you're creating, that we have to get back into buying, back into driving, back into going into the restaurant. That is a nightmare and that is not leadership and you are not protecting us from harm, which is your only job, not, not um, supporting the people that are paying for your campaigns, the restaurateurs or the small businesses or whatever, the large business. It has to be about resiliency for the people. And that is what we have to get back to basics. And it is about creating the model of growing food locally. And, and then all of your neighbors, you know, you provide for yourself and anything you need, you get from your neighbors. And that's the way they do it in Hawaii. They come with their food. We become producers, not consumers. That's what we have to become. And that we all need to learn how to produce our food so we can barter and trade and get the varieties but on all the other needs we need locally without hot spots. Thank, thank you. Paul Soto. I'm reading a definition from the Smithsonian Museum. The self-serving concept of manifest destiny, the belief that the expansion of the United States was divinely ordained, justifiable, and inevitable, was used to rationalize the removal of American Indians from the native homelands. In the minds of white Americans, the Indians were not using the land to its fullest potential. We use the word catalyze or activate today. Um, as they reserved large tracts of land, of unspoiled land for hunting, leaving the land uncultivated. If it was not being cultivated, then the land was being wasted. Americans declared that it was their duty, their manifest destiny, which compelled them to seize, to murder, and to codify into law the legal removal of Native Americans from their land. Not surprisingly, the most active supporters of manifest destiny and proponents of Indian removal were those who practiced land speculation. Land speculators bought large tracts of land with the expectation that the land would quickly increase in value as more people settled in the West and demand for the Western land increased, end quote. Now, um, I think that we can see some parallels within this context. And this, this was a mindset that happened in 1846 here in this city. And so when we're talking about equity, okay, Equity doesn't mean giving uh, District 9 the same benefits as District 5 or District 7. What equity means is that you guys have had enough and we need to start giving to these people because these are the ones that work in your restaurants, work in your hotels, that, garden, that do your gardening, that work inside the, the houses. It's becoming sickening because we're becoming sociopathic and indifferent to suffering. Phone number 5140. Now, you hear the same buzzwords in these uh, meetings from the city council and the mayor, equity, equality, assistance, unhoused, transparency, town hall, urban villages. You hear all these words and they, it's like out of a college sophomore social science class. I'm trying to think of the more words that I, the other words. Oh, bike lanes, road diets. That's my favorite one. Road diet. It's going to create more traffic with these road diets. And I know Pam, you're into the road diet. I, I'm not. And I, I heard Paul talk a little bit about District Nine. He should move to District Nine. He can see how wonderful it is under under uh, Pam Foley's leadership. Yeah, it's it's not a great place, Paul. It may it may seem cool, but I go to your neighborhoods to have some fun and go to decent restaurants and uh, you know, go to some decent stores. We don't have any here for sure. This place is Dolesville. You actually Paul would hate it if you lived here. It's not just the white people. But uh, yeah, I mean th th these meetings that you have it's the same story. He's Pam has called me a broken record. Pam, you're the biggest broken record I've ever heard in my whole life. You could fill up an hour full of hot air better than I can, and that's saying something. That's really saying something. But, I mean, we got the potholes, the burned-out buildings. Uh, your, your staff knows nothing. Your staff never gets back to me. 
they're too good. You got a bunch of queens working down there. I swear to God, there is one good staff member. Shirley's really nice. I talked to her the other day. She's a good person. I don't know what she's doing with you, but uh, yeah, I mean, you between De- I mean Deb Davis, her office never calls back, and your your buddy, the police chief, the San Jose Police Department never picks up the. Thank you. That's enough. I'm done with you. <laughs> Leaving now.